1 Corinthians chapter 13 is going to be the text for today. And I, I hear this a lot about love and hate. I hear people say that they are just different sides of the same coin. We're going to get into that. Right? It's easy to hate. Yes, it is. All right? We don't need much of a reason to hate somebody. Sometimes we don't need a reason at all. Well, let's take a look. We, we talked about some of these people last week. We talked about Zacchaeus. Mark, now, he's got to be easy to hate. All right? He's a tax collector. Something about working for the IRS just does not espouse love, does it? Okay? But he wasn't just a tax collector. He said he was a cheat. He cheated people out of their hard-earned money so he could get rich. Easy to hate a guy like that, right? It's okay to hate a guy like that. Come on. He's a cheat. He's a liar. He's a thief. Huh? And he works for the IRS. It's okay to hate a guy like that, right? The sinful woman. All right, well... What do we know about her from last week? Well, one, she was a prostitute. Right? She used men. She was a lover of money and a destroyer of marriages and families. And she loved doing it. She flaunted it. Okay to hate somebody like that. about the woman at the well, all right? Well, probably the first label we would put on her is loser. Come on, she was married four times, divorced four times. I didn't think, uh, she was in running with, what's that guy from Friends? All right, how many ever watched that show, Friends? <coughs> yeah. What's that guy, Ross? Yeah, all right? Okay, every time he got married, he got divorced, okay? This was her, okay? And now she's living with a guy that's not her husband just so she can have a roof over her head. Loser. It's okay to hate somebody like that, right? Well, not only was she married and divorced four times, not only is she living with a man, not her husband, she's a Samaritan. And we know about them people, don't we? Easy to hate somebody like that. Then we talked about a girl named Amy. Remember Amy last week? Amy? Amy was a lesbian. She used people. Right? She did things just to shock people. Come on. She came to church with her lesbian lover just to see how many people she could shock and how long it would be before they, they threw her out. Right? Easy to hate somebody like that, isn't it? How about the demoniac at, at the Gerasenes? You remember him? Here's what, the, what Scripture writes about him. All right? he, was, he was always naked and he was always cutting himself. He was so wild and so wicked that they, he had to live in the caves. He was never in his right mind. He was leaking, leaking, leaking. That's all, folks, wrapping around crazy. And he was possessed by demons. So he's got to be evil, right? Easy to hate somebody like that. How about the thief on the cross? Come on. First of all, the only thing we know about him is what? I just told you. He's a thief. All right? 
and he was sentenced to die. Now, I'm, there were two of them, okay? The one guy, he's still angry. He's still yelling and cursing at people. Easy to hate a guy like that, right? It's okay to hate somebody like that, right? Nobody's answering. I don't like your tone. <laughs> I'm gonna get. How about lepers? Come on, they got that awful, contagious disease. That the, that even the law says they got to be kicked out of the community. Right? And of course, you know, God gave them that disease because they did something wrong, right? Oh. How about blind people? Man, they're always in the way. And they're always poking you with that stick, right? And good grief, you know. We, uh, I, now, okay, I gotta say this. I don't, this is something I don't understand. But you know, you drive up to the to the drive up tellers, the, the ATM machines, and they're in braille. Think about that for a second. The drive-up ATMs are in Braille. Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> Come on. The Romans. It was easy in Jesus' day to hate them. They occupied the city where they weren't wanted. They were brutal. They were putting people in jail for no reason. You know, it's okay to hate somebody like that, right? Murderers. All right, let me throw a little list out. John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, and no, that's not the guy from the TV show. Charles Manson, uh -oh. Idi Amin, Osama bin Laden. Easy to hate you. Got people like that, right? It's okay to hate people like that, right? Rapists. Okay, guys. <clears throat> this guy in jail had just brutally raped your daughter. Your wife. Your sister, your mom. It's okay to hate somebody like that, right? You get my point so far? This is where we, this is where we come off and saying it's okay to hate. It's easy to hate. It was no different in Jesus' day. No different, right? At his birth, Herod tried to kill him, right? We don't know exactly how many, but many innocent little boys in Bethlehem were murdered because of this guy. Now, it's easy to hate him, right? Easy to hate her? It's okay to hate him? Huh? Well, how can it be easy and not okay? I'll get that. Alright? In John 1, chapter, uh, John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, it says that he came into his own and they didn't know him. It basically comes out that he came into his own and they disowned him. Now, how do we know they disowned him? Well, they say he was mad. They say he was crazy. They said he was demon-possessed, that he was performing miracles and kicking out demons by the power of the devil. They were basically calling him a, a devil worshiper. And in worse, they called him a blasphemer. 
Now, that's okay to hate somebody like that, right? Come on. He, he, he's, he's crazy, right? He's crazy. And he claims to be the Son of God. That's what this whole thing about blasphemy is. That he, being a man, claims to be equal to God. At one point, they picked up rocks and they were going to stone him. And he said to them, for what work do you, do you try to stone me? And they said, not for any good works, but you, being a mere man, claim to be God. It was no different in his day. It was nothing new. All right? Today, it's no different. I don't know what year it was, but it was uh, at the Brickyard 400 in Indianapolis. And a local preacher, Church of Christ preacher, was asked to have the opening prayer for the Brickyard 400. And he came to the infield uh, of, 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 of the, the racetrack and he had to pray. And he ended the prayer in Jesus' name. And people booed. Local talk show host demanded that he apologize for being insensitive to other people's beliefs. Letters to the editor demanded that the people who run the Brickyard 400 never bring this man back to pray again. He was insensitive. There were those sitting in the attendance that didn't believe in Jesus. Now, had he just ended his prayer with amen instead of in Jesus' name, nobody would have been offended. But because he prayed in Jesus' name, he raised a lot of ire from the people. And yet, this is in Indianapolis. And Indianapolis is in the heart of of what we call the Bible Belt. But that's nothing new. We have people who are going around uh, crying out they don't want manger scenes in public places. Yet it's okay to put a wicked staff, but not a manger. They want crosses, and I love this, uh, they want crosses taken away from city symbols and federal grounds. Uh, remember 911? Remember that picture? Uh, it, it's burned in my head. Uh, while all when, when two towers fell and they were panning through, through the area as people were running and, and fleeing from the two buildings. And there, in, amid all the, all the smoke, from, from the rubble, from the, uh, the, the stone. All of a sudden, from the back, the sun shone through, and there was that cross. The two beads that were together like a cross. I remember seeing that. I said, that gave me hope. That piece was taken down when they rebuilt and it is put in a museum in New York City. It's called the Ground Zero uh, Museum. They got all the names of, of the people that, that, that were killed there and, and pictures and everything like that. And there are a group of people who are demanding that that cross be removed from that museum. There's another place. I'd love to see them try to do this. They want. Uh, crosses removed from federal grounds. I'd love to see them try to do it at Arlington National Cemetery. But this is nothing new. 
They want the Ten Commandments taken off courtroom walls. Now, I don't remember. I, I know it was a comedian, um, uh, uh, George Collin, matter of fact. It was George Collin, and he said, that makes perfect sense to take ten, the Ten Commandments off, uh, off of uh, courthouse walls and off of uh, political chambers. He said, why would you have something that says, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit murder, in a place where all you got is liars, murderers, and thieves? It creates a hostile environment. He was being funny, okay? But we, this is not funny, all right? We, we have this going on right here. We, have, we want the Ten Commandments taken off courtroom wall. We, have, we want the Bibles taken out of school. So this hatred is nothing new. It's nothing new. It's easy to hate people who do this, right? Well, okay. They would say, and they would quote Romans 12, 9, even God hates. God hates evil. Right? That's what it says. Incomplete. It says that God hates sin, but He loves the sinner. In Psalm 45, 7, it, it, it talks about uh, about hating evil. And again, we do the same thing. We, we look at these situations. We look at that list. We look at Zacchaeus. We look at the, the sinful woman. We look at the woman at the well. We look at Amy. We look at the demoniac. We look at uh, the thief on the cross. We look at murderers and rapists and thieves and liars. And we say, aren't these people evil? Therefore, it's right to hate them. And that answer is wrong because it isn't the people that are evil. It's what they do. A good question came up to me this week. And it says, how can you love someone who doesn't love you? Now, I'm not going to tell you that, you know, you, you got your eye on this particular girl or particular guy. If you do this, you're going to get them to fall in love with you. I'm not talking about that kind of love. We're talking about agape. We're talking about unconditional love. All right? We're not talking about philos, this, this intimate love between a man and a woman. We're talking about this unconditional love that, that God has called us to do. First of all, what is love? Love is the greatest of all the virtues. At the end of this chapter, he said, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. All right? and, and I like the, what Bob Martin said. Uh, did with us one time when he was talking about that. He said, because there's going to come a time when faith is going to be no more. Faith is believing in things unseen. That's what it is. That's the Sunday school answer. All right? Faith is believing in things unseen. At one, in one time, in the future, we will see and know all things. We will see God as He is. So faith will no longer be required. We will have our eternal destiny sealed. We are either going to be in heaven or hell. I don't care what other people tell you. There's no third choice. There's no place to go to work it off. Uh, so you can gain heaven. In eternity, two choices. Heaven or hell. You make that choice here, not there. It'll be too late then. But here we have that hope of eternal salvation through Christ. One day that hope will be answered. So there will be no more need. But 
in the presence of God there always, 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 always will be that unconditional love. And that's why it is the greatest of all the virtues. Alright? So what else is it? It is patient. Alright? The reason that the world has not yet come to an end is because God is patient. He is not wanting anyone to be condemned, but everyone to come to eternal life. And He is patiently waiting for those to come to Him. Now, don't get too prideful, because I heard, I heard this before. Ha ha, oh well, that's good. I know the Lord's waiting for me to come to Him, so uh, as long as I hold out, the world won't come to an end, so uh, I'm going to hold out. Uh, uh -uh. Don't get that prideful because you know what? There will become a time where he will not wait any longer. That is why he says very explicitly in Scripture, today, right here, right now, this hour, this minute, this is the time of salvation. It isn't something that we can put off. You put it off, it may be too late. And where will you end up? You will be ending up outside, in the darkness, weeping and wailing, gnashing of teeth, and eternal torment. <clears throat> Love is patient, but not eternal. Love is kind. Right? Kindness sees the good. One thing I want to get, if I get no other point across today, I want to get this point across. Alright? God's kindness is not that He overlooks our sin. He doesn't overlook it. He looks past it. And He sees the masterpiece. He looks past all that sin. And he sees, there you are. Well, what I think about is a sculptor one time uh, went out, got a big piece of rock, and started the work on it. And when he got done, it was a beautiful, beautiful statue. And people came from far and wide to compliment him on the, on the statue. He says, it was already there. All I did was chisel away the bad pieces. That's what God does. That's the kindness. He, he washes away the mud because He sees the masterpiece. Thank God that He didn't give up on us. That He didn't let us get punished as our sins deserve. That He looked past our sin and He sees us and He sees the masterpiece that we created in us. And that's why he's come. Alright? Love trusts. Okay? God sent his son. He sent us his word. And he put his trust in us that we will do the right thing. He didn't, he doesn't make us. Alright? He doesn't make us. Because if we if he made us, now could he? Yeah, he could. He'd have to take away free will. But he could. But he doesn't. Why? Because he trusts us. He trusts us to do the right thing. And he made it simple. Alright? He said, this is what you got to do to be saved. He said, repent. Confess. Believe. Be baptized by immersion. And to walk a godly life. He did everything else. Uh, and I, I've said this before. I don't understand how that can take away all my sin. I don't. I just trust God. He said it. I believe it. That's evident. All right? But that's love. That's the trust. All right? Protects. 
I, you know, sometimes I come up with things that keep me up at night. Right? A mother bear will always, always, always protect her cubs. Right? Okay? Some lionesses have been known to eat their young. Sharks have been known to eat their young. Why? Ponder that. Maybe it'll keep you up at night now too. We can find an answer somewhere. But God has this perfect love that He protects. Uh, and again, I go to Hebrews. And in Hebrews He says that God will not allow us to be tested beyond our ability to resist. He will not allow us to be tempted. He protects us from that way. And how do I get it? I get it from a conversation that God has with Satan in the book of Job. All right? Now, we, we, we look at Satan and, and we, we think of this all-powerful kind of being. Well, guess what? He's just like you and me. He's bound by God. Mm -hmm. He's not free to do everything he wants to do. Thank God he is not free to do whatever he wants to do. But he's got to get permission. Now, don't go and test him and say, ha, ah, you can't do anything unless God gives you permission. Oh, I, don't, I wouldn't want to do that. Okay? But thank God that he holds him back. That's the protection. All right? Perseverance. I was in high school and, and I, I, I kept hearing this from all my teachers about my character is that I persevered and I had no idea what they were talking about. But I wasn't going to give up until I found out. You get it. That's what persevere means. You don't give up. You don't give up. All right? God never gave up on us. Say that. God. 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 Never. Never. Gave up. Gave up on, us. on me. God never gave up on me. That's perseverance. Why are we still alive today? We're still alive today to do His will. We're still alive today so that if we're outside of Christ, we can come to Christ and have, eter have that eternal security. That's perseverance. Right? So, how can you show love to someone who doesn't love you? No matter what you do, no matter how much kindness you show, they, they, they show nothing but disdain for you. No matter how much you, you, you show love to someone, they show nothing but hatred for you. So how do you show love to someone who does not love you? By the cross. You do, we do what Jesus did. We just, it isn't our responsibility to get them to love us. Our responsibility is to love them anyway. Look at, look, look at that list again. Zacchaeus, the sinful woman, the Samaritan woman, the demoniac, Amy, the lepers, the blind, the thief on the cross. And add two letters to that list. U.S. Us. How did God show His love for us? He gave. He gave His Son so that we can be free. Did we love Him? No. Actually, we, we say we love Him 
Why? Because He first loved us. We sang that this morning. Because He first loved us. Right? What happened to all these people? Well, you look at Zacchaeus. He was set free. He has, he has one meeting with Jesus and he comes out from that meeting giving back to everybody that he stole from and not just what he stole, but even more. And he ends up giving to the poor. He's a completely changed man. He is set free. Why? Because he was in bondage because of hatred. Hate blinds and binds. But love sets us free. Look at the sinful woman. She is so, your sins are forgiven. She weeps a river. She was set free. The Samaritan woman comes in contact with Jesus and she runs back to the people who don't like her, who talk bad about her, and says, come and see the man who told me everything I ever done. Could he be the Christ? She was the first female evangelist. Why? Because Jesus showed her the one thing that she needed. He showed her that love and it set her free. Amy. Amy said, Amy's story. Remember Amy's story last week? The closer she came to Jesus, the more and more the shackles were falling away. And she was set free. She now ministers to people who, who have those same kind of struggles that she had. She, she ministers to women who have been victims of rape. She, she ministers to, to the homosexual community to have, so that they can be released. Right? Why? Because Christ set her free. Right? The thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And he enters into death, a free man. Now, it does, this freedom, I want to make this very clear. This freedom doesn't mean that we are going to be set free from the penalties of our sin. No. We may still have to bear some of that here. But we're set free from the biggest penalty. How many remember Elizabeth Barrett Browning? She wrote some of the most beautiful love letters, didn't she? How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. That's one of hers. Elizabeth was raised by a very tyrannical father. And one time in disciplining her, he injured her so bad that she became semi-invalid. She fell in love with a man and married him and her parents did not approve. She moved to Italy and every day she would write a letter to her parents expressing to her parents how much she loved them. About 10 years into writing this, she gets back a box in the mail. And when she opens the box, it's all her letters unopened. And those letters today compose some of the beautiful, beautiful books by Elizabeth Barrett Browning that were published, and some of the greatest love letters. And her parents never knew. So how do you love somebody? How do you show love to somebody that doesn't love you, you just do it. That's all. You just do it. All will be set free by the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. By showing this love. First, you keep yourself from being bound up by hate. And second, it may just reach that one 
and show them that God loves them, that He can see through the mess that they've made in their lives, and He can set them free. And what a greater way to do that than to just do what Jesus did. We're going to stand and we're going to sing our invitation. And as we do, two things come to mind. One, maybe we need to just fall more in love with Jesus. Well, this is an opportunity to do so. Or maybe we've never given our lives to Christ. And we're still in that bondage. Well, today, right here, right now, now is the time where you can be set free. So as we stand and we sing uh, our invitation hymn, I want you to think about that. And, and if any of that applies to you, then please, please take the opportunity to make it right. Number 460, Room at the Cross for you.